real estate by or selling a home is usually the biggest deal most people ever make. It is another negotiation most people hate. Home buyers and sellers are often afraid they will be hoodwinked. That won't happen if you use the right negotiation tools. When Pamela Beach Christensen filled out her mortgage application, someone at the mortgage company told her the interest rate a lock in period was six days. But when she got her approval, the lock in period specified was only 30 days. If I had taken note of all phone calls, personnel, phone numbers, even before there was a problem, said Pamela. Now a senior advisor with the U.S. State Department in Paris, she next got the company's mission statement, which listed various standards, including the importance of customer service. When the mortgage company's provider failed to return several phone calls, Pamela documented that they time, message left, etc. She continued to look the company's bad behavior while going up the chain of command at the bank. Within a few days, she got the extra 30 days back. Do you have to go to these lengths to get what was promised to you? Sometimes, unfortunately, you do carry a pen and notebook with you. If you are nervous about the other side keeping their promise or when the stakes are high, take down details. It may seem ex excessive, but the first time you need it, you will realize it was worth all the trouble. Real estate commissions for brokers across the country vary from 1% to 6%. People who negotiate with brokers stand to save thousands of dollars. Above 4% is considered excessive by most. May think above 2% is excessive. Wouldn't you rather have those extra funds in your pocket? On the sale of a house for $300,000, a 2% point a lower commission is worth $6,000. That's not chicken feed. Century 21 offered to sell Jay Chan's home for a 3% commission. He did some research on the internet and found that JeepReality.com charged only 2%. Jay, an equity analyst near Philadelphia, prepared to sell his house to Century 21 because they were local, somewhat accessible. But he would do so only if they dropped their commission. They did, offering to sell it for a 2.5% commission, savings on a $500,000 house, $2,500. Negotiation time, five minutes to news the standards. If you are worried that your real estate agent won't try as hard if you pay less, try being creative. Offer incentives, let's say you and your broker have booked have looked at competitive sales and agree your house will sell for about $400,000. So you offer a 2% commission for any sale up to $400,000 and 20% of everything over $400,000. If the agent sells the house for $450,000, the commission is $8,000 for the first $400,000 and $10,000 for the extra $50,000. The total commission of $18,000 comes to 4% overall. 
does the thought of paying the extra money bother you? If so, you have to get out of that mindset. The extra $40,000 net that you received of $400,000 is found money. Think about meeting your goals, not about meeting over someone else. You can pursue other creative options. One is a flip fee, another is a hourly fee, with a wrap, with a cap, each of these needs performance standards. The agent actually had to sell the house. The more of a personal connection you make with everyone involved, the more likely you are to meet your goals. Try to meet the other party. Make a small talk. Find out if they have intangible needs. Introduce your children to their children. This is also important. Because if anything goes wrong in the cell, the relationship is a cushion to prevent the deal from tanking. A participant in one of my courses went to get a house in San Francisco. The place was jammed with potential buyers. When he got a moment with the with the owner, instead of talking about price, the buyer asked the, the owner why he was selling, where he was moving, etc. After about 20 minutes, the seller kicked everyone else out and sold the house to this guy for less than the highest offer. Why? Because trust was established. A lot of people play games when buying or selling things. Others don't keep commitments. In this case, the seller felt comfortable that the deal would actually happen with this one buyer who made the effort to get to know him. Often, an agent won't let you near the other party. That's because the agent thinks you will go around them and negate the commission. Ask a reluctant agent if that is their fear. Offer to sign a specific non-circumvention agreement that guarantees the commission if the deal goes through. Even if an agent refuses to let you meet the other party, keep peppering the agent with a question about that. The more you find out, the more likely your connection will surface. Even through a third party, remember, the difference between success and failure is small. Many stages require disclosure statement by the seller. There can be steep penalties for incompleteness. After reading the statement carefully, insist on getting an inspector to go through the house. If the seller refuses, be suspicious. Ask them how you can pay a lot of money for something that isn't inspected. Any price you offer before the inspection should be subject to the inspection. If the inspector finds major issues, you can negotiate the price downward. This happened in buying other house. The inspector found a lot of non-disclosed issues. The agent said, too bad, the price stays. I said, what are you going to do with the next buyer? The agent said, she wouldn't change the disclosure statement. I said that she now had knowledge of the facts in the house, and if they want won the disclosure statement, she could lose her license. It was a hard bargain situation, but we used the standards and a vision of the future in order to be successful. 
I did not threaten the agent directly. I said that you were willing buyers right there. Why start over again? We bought the house for 19% below the asking price in a strong market. As a seller, this means you don't want to hide things. Give bad use up front. If the buyers can get past it, you'll have a good set, especially if they trust you. Mention the bad with the good. Give them your ideas on how to fix the bad. I like the list of local contacts you like. It adds credibility. Family business. No chapter on buying and selling would be complete without looking at family businesses. More than 80% of the world's employees work for businesses owned by families. A third of the U.S. Fortune 500, about 170 firms, are owned by families. Family-owned businesses produce more than 65% of the U.S. gross national product and more than that internationally. These are astonishing numbers. Most business schools and economists don't deal much with the dynamics of buying and selling involving family-owned businesses. So many business leaders are ill-equipped to deal with most business enterprises. And most of those in family-owned businesses do not deal well with the dynamics involved either. I've advised on family-owned business deals. I've owned my own business. I've been a partner in family-owned businesses. I do cases in class on family-owned business and have written cases on family-owned businesses. So I've experienced the dynamics firsthand as well as studied them. Here are the dynamics of concern in any negotiation involving these kinds of businesses, that is, most of the world's businesses. Family business, some traits, pride, emotion, strong egos, people fighting all the battles, many feel undervalued, unappreciated, centralized decision making, an organizational structure that may not reflect actual power or influence, assets or value due to personal efforts for decades, less shared or holder driven. Personal finances may cloud company finances. Not so easy to fire people. Intangibles are very important. Lesser reliance on outside expertise. The culture of company is key. Competition. Competence is not necessarily key for job. Clearly, emotion, the enemy of effective negotiation, is much more prevalent in family-owned businesses. Many of those in such businesses take almost everything personally. They feel undervalued. They fight about yesterday. They do not make a decision based on logic. They do a lot of things that do not result in good deals. They have a harder time meeting their own goals. And their goals are often not just about money. When one deals with a family-owned business, one has to pay extra attention to whether emotion is a driving decision, to whether intangibles must be provided and to whether emotional payments must be made. Ask yourself to what extent ego might influence price. That's true. Whether you are buying a handcrafted stage in South America or an entire company in Chicago, it's true. Whether I'm selling an idea to three brothers in Atlanta or trying to sell someone's coffee plantation in Africa, People who are emotionalist-less or often get distracted more easily from their goals. 
the tools in getting one will help managers deal effectively with such issues. As with cross-cultural negotiation, it starts with a find and value the perceptions of the other party. Michael Farley, an investment banking partner in the former accounting firm Arthur Anderson, was having a hard time buying an apparel company for a client. The owner's expectation were altogether unrealistic, Michael said. Little by little, Michael and his group were able to peel the onion. It was very emotional for him, said Michael. And now, a director of my Miami based real estate acquisition company. By putting ourselves in his shoes, we found the answer. They found out that the owner wanted to stay on for three years with various perks. He wanted half a percent equity worth two million dollars <throat> in the company. He wanted use of the company jet particularly to take him to and from his eight weeks of vacation each year. His employees needed to be able to stay on. In return for these intangibles, Michael was able to buy a company worth more than $400 million for only $42 million in cash and a lot of stuff. One buyer had an even more difficult emotional conflict with a seller of a privately held company. One owner wanted to sell, the other owner didn't want to sell. When asked why not, the owner who didn't want to sell said, I want to die at my desk. These are the kind of seller issues for which one must be prepared. To go forward, the buyer create an active and meaningful role for what he called the die-hard founder. In return, the buyer got the price of the company lowered. Emotions were much more important than money or anything else, said the buyer. Finally, from the sublim to small talk is almost always effective. It makes you more human in the period negotiation of your life, and it will gain you more. Josh Ali went to Delhi on Sunday. He wanted the Tuesday special, a turkey huggy with fries and drink, half a price. No deal. He ordered it anyway, at full price, no complex. How about these pills? Josh asked the sandwich maker. Baseball talk ensued. Josh put a one dollar tip in the jar. As they chatted, the sandwich and fresh grew inside. Then the server gave him the Tuesday deal on Sunday and a lot of food. The tea was forming a personal connection said Josh, now an attorney, to everyone else. It was just a conversation at the deli. To Josh, it was a negotiation that resulted in getting one.